Cube presents UiPath Forward 5. Brought to you by UiPath. Hi everybody, Dave Vellante with David Nicholson. We're back at UiPath Forward 5. We're getting ready for the big guns to come in, the two co-CEOs, but we have a really special analyst panel now. We're excited to have Daniel Newman here. He's the principal analyst at Futurum Research, and Andy Tarai, who's the vice president and principal analyst at Constellation Research. Guys, good to see you. Thanks for making some time to come on theCUBE. Glad to be here. Always good. So Andy, you're deep into AI. You and I have been talking about having you come to our Marlboro office. I'm, I'm really excited that we were able to meet here. Uh, what have you seen at the show so far? What are your big takeaways, you know, day one and a half? Yeah, well, uh, so first of all, I'm deep in AI because my last name has AI and I yeah, yeah. talked about <laughs> it. So, but, but all jokes aside, um, there are a lot of good things I heard from the conference, right? I mean, one is the last two years because of the pandemic, the growth has been phenomenal for, for a lot of this robotic automation, intelligent automation companies, right? So, because the low-hanging fruit of decision-making processes have been already taken care of, where are they going to find the next growth spot, right? That was the question I was looking at answers to. And they have some, uh, in first one, a good acquisition they had, intelligent document processing, but more importantly, they're trying to move from deterministic rules-based RPA automation into AI-based, more probabilistic, subjective decision-making areas. That's a huge market. There's tons of money involved in it, but it's going to be a harder problem to solve. Love to see the execute. Well, it's also a big pivot for the, for the company. It started out as sort of a, a point product and now is moving to, to platform. But Daniel, the macro is not in UiPath's favor. It's not really in any you know, tech company's favor, but especially you know, a company that's going into a transition, transitioning to go to market, et cetera. What are you seeing, what's your take on the macro? I mean, I know you follow the financial markets very closely. There's a lot of negative sentiment right now. Are you as negative as the sentiment? Well, the, the broad sentiment comes with some pretty good uh, historical data, right? We've had probably one of the worst market years in multiple decades. Um, and of course, we're coming into a situation where all the, the factors are really not in our favor. You've got interest rates climbing, you've got wildly high inflation, you've had a, you know, helicopters dumping money on the economy for a period of time, and we're, we're going to get into this great reset, is what I keep talking about. But you know, I had the opportunity to talk to Bill McDermott recently on one of my shows, and uh, Bill's CEO of ServiceNow, in case anybody out there doesn't know. But, Former SAP. Um, and yeah, really Cubalon. well spoken guy. But mm. you know, him and I kind of went back and forth and we came up with this kind of concept that we were going to have to tech our way out of what's about to come. You can almost be certain recession is going to come. But for companies like UiPath, I actually think there's a tremendous opportunity. Because the bottom line is companies are going to be looking at their bottom line. A year ago, it was all about growth. A deal like the Adobe Figma deal would have been, uh, been lauded. People would have been excited. Now everybody's looking at it going, how are they paying that price? Everybody's discounting the future growth. They're looking at the situation, saying, what's going to happen next? Well, bottom line is now they're looking at that, how profitable are we? Are you making money? Are you growing that bottom line? Are you creating earnings? We're going to come into an era. Like, We're right? going to come into an era where companies are going to say, you know what? People are expensive. The inflationary cost of hiring is expensive. You know what's less expensive? Investing in the cloud investing in AI, investing in workflow and automation, and things that actually enable businesses to expand, um, keep costs somewhat contained, fixed costs, and scale their businesses and get themselves in a good position for when the economy turns to return to growth. So since prior to the pandemic, uh, cloud, containers, AI ML, and RPA slash automation have been the big four that from a spending data standpoint have been above the line, above all the, kind of the rest in terms of spending momentum up until last quarter, AI and RPA slash automation declined. So my question is, are those two areas discretionary? Or well, more discretionary than other technology investments? We I heard, think, well, ahead, I, I think we're in a, a period where companies are, I won't say they've stopped spending, but you listen to Mark Benioff, he talked about the elongated sales cycle. Right. I think companies right now are being very reflective and they're doing a lot of introspection. They're looking at their business and saying, we hired a lot of people, we hired really fast, do we need to cut, do we need to freeze? We've made investments in technology, are we getting a return on them? We all know that the analytics, whether it's you know, digital adoption platforms or just analytics in the business, say, hey, what is all this money we've been spending doing for us and how productive are we? 
But I will tell you universally, the companies are looking at workflow automations that enable things, whether that's onboarding customers, whether that's delivering experiences, whether that's you know, full um, you know, price to quote technologies, automate, automate, automate. By doing that, they're going to bring down the cost, they're going to control themselves as best as possible in a tough macro, and then when they come out of it, these processes are going to be beneficiary in a, in a growth environment even more so. Andy, uh, UiPath rocketed to a leadership position, largely in, due to this, the product and the simplicity of the product uh, relative to the competition. And then, uh, as you well know, they expanded into you know, platform. So how do you see the competitive environment? Uh, UiPath is, again, focusing on that platform play. Automation Anywhere couldn't get to a public market. They had turnover at the go-to-market level. Uh, Chris Riley joined, a lot of, lot of hope left. Microsoft joined into the fray. Obviously, it's having an impact. Uh, that you're cer certainly seeing spending momentum around Microsoft. Then SAP, ServiceNow, Salesforce, every software company on the planet thinks they should get every dollar spent on software. You know, they, they see UiPath's momentum and they say, hey, we can, we can take some of that off the table. How do you see the competitive environment right now? So, first of all, in, in my mind, UiPath is slightly better because of a couple of reasons. One, as you said, it's ease of use. Um, they are able to customize it very well to what they want, so that's a real easy development advantage. And then the, when you develop the bots in Equaler, it takes an average anywhere between two to maybe six weeks, generally speaking. In some industries, regulated government, it might take more. So the, it's faster, quicker, easier than others, in a sense, so people love using that. The second advantage what they have, in my mind, is that not only they are available as a managed SaaS solution on, on cloud, on Azure cloud, but also they have this version that you can install, maintain, manage any way you want, whether it's a public cloud or, or your own data center and so on and so forth. That's not available with almost, not all of them have it. Few have it but not all of the competitors have it. So they have an advantage there as well. Where it could become useful would be, one of the areas that they haven't even expanded is the government. government is the what, the, sorry? The government yeah, yeah. related solutions, right? Defense, government, all of those areas when you go, which haven't even started for various reasons. For example, they're worried about laying off people, worried about costs, worried about automating things. There's a lot of hurdles to overcome. But once you overcome that, if you want to go there, nobody's going to use, or most of them will be wary of using something on the cloud. So they have a solution for that version, variation of that. So they are set up to come to that next level. I mean, I don't know if you guys were at the keynote. Um, yeah, yeah. The CEO talked about how their plans to go from one billion to five billion in AR. So they are set up to capture the market. But again, as you said, every big software company saw their momentum, they want to get into it, they want to compete with them, so. Well, to get to five billion, they've got to accelerate growth. I mean, if you do 20% CAGR over the next, you know, through the end of the decade, they don't quite get there. So they're going to have to, you know, they lowered their forecast down to from high 20, or mid 20s to 18%. They're going to have to accelerate that. And we've seen that before, we've seen it in cloud, where cloud, you know, accelerates growth, even though you got the law of large numbers. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, so Daniel, then how do we, how do we think of this market? How do you measure the TAM, the total addressable market, for automation? I mean, you know, what's, that, what's that metric that shows how unautomated are we? How inefficient are we? Is there a 5% is there a efficiency that can be gained? Is there a 40% efficiency that can be gained? Because if you're talking about you know, how much of the market can UiPath capture, first of all, how big is the market? And then, is UiPath poised to take advantage of that compared to the actual purveyors of the software that people are interacting with. If I'm interacting with an ERP, an ERP system that has built into it the ability to automate processes, then why do I need UiPath? So first, how do you evaluate TAM? Second, how do you evaluate whether UiPath is going to have a chance in this market where RPA is built into the applications that we actually use? Yeah, I think the TAM is evolving and I don't have it in front of me right now, but what I'll tell you about the TAM is there's sort of the legacy RPA TAM, and then there's what I would sort of evolve to call the IPA and workflow automation TAM that is being addressed by many of these software companies that you asked in the competitive equation and the, and the, and the question. What we're seeing is a world where companies are going to say, if we can automate it, we will automate it. That's it's actually non-negotiable. 
Now the process in the ability to arrive at automation at scale has long been a battlefront within an or every organization. We've been able to automate things for a long time. Why hasn't more been done? It's the same thing with analytics. There's been numerous studies in analytics that have basically shown companies that have been able to embrace, adopt, and implement analytics have significantly better performances. Better performances on revenue growth, better performances in operational cost management, better performances with customer experience. Guess what? Not everybody, every company can get to this. Now there's a couple of things behind this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to close my answer out because I'm getting a little long-winded here, but the first thing is automation is a cultural challenge in most organizations. We've done endless research on companies digitally transforming and automating their business and what we found is largely the technology are somewhat comparable. Meaning, you know, I've heard what he's saying about some of the advantages, a partnership with Microsoft, very compelling. But you know what, all these companies that have automation offerings, whether it's you know, through a Salesforce, Microsoft, whether it's a specialized R RPA, like an Automation Anywhere, or a UiPath, their solutions can be deployed and successful. The company's ability to in take the investment, implement it successfully, and get buy-in across the organization tends to always be the hurdle. An old CIO stat, 50% of IT projects fail. That stat is still almost accurate today. It's not 50% of technology is bad, but those failures are because the culture doesn't get behind it, and automation's a tricky one, because there's a lot of people that feel on the outside rather than the inside of an automation transformation. So Andy, so how do you think about the, to Dave's question, the SAPs, the service now, is trying to, you know, at least take some breadcrumbs off the table. They, they're, <laughs> going to, they're going to create these automation stovepipes, but in Automation Anywhere or, or UiPath is a horizontal play, are they yep. not? And so, how do you think about that well, progression? So, first of all, all of these other companies, when they, whether it's a build, acquire, what have you, these guys already have, what, five, seven years on them. So it's going to be difficult for them to catch up with the center of excellence, knowledge, and the use cases, what they got to catch up with them. That's going to be a lot of catch up. Just to give you an idea, Microsoft Power Automate has been there for a while, right? They're supposedly doing well as well, but they still choose to partner with the UiPath as well to get them to the next level. So there is going to be competition coming from all areas, but it's, it's about, you know. <laughs> so, so who is the competition? Is it Microsoft chipping away at individual productivity? Is it a service now who's got a platform play? Um, is it th themselves just being able to they, execute? All, plus also, but I think the, the most, I wouldn't say competition, but it's more people are not aware of what areas need to be automated, right? For example, one of the things I was talking about with a couple of customers is, um, so they have an automation hub where you can put the, the process and, and tasks that need to be automated and then you prioritize and start working on it. And, and almost all of them that I speak to, they keep saying that most of the process and task identification that they need to do for automation, it's manual right now. So which means it's limited. You have to go and execute it. When people find out and tell you that's what needs to be fixed, you try to go and fix that. But imagine if there's a way, I mean, they have solutions that they're, they're showcasing now, if it becomes popular, if you're able to identify tasks that are very inefficient or, or process that's very inefficient automatically, score them up, saying that, you know what, this is what is going to be your ROI and you execute on it, that's going to be huge. So I think Daniel's right, there's no shortage of, of a market. I, I, would, I would agree with you there. Yeah. Rob Enslin this morning talked about the progression, he sort of compared it to ERP of the early days. I sort of have a love-hate with ERP because of the complexity of the implementation and the, and the cost. However, first of all, a couple points, and I would love to get your thoughts. For you, if you went back, I don't know, 25 years, you, you wouldn't have been able to pick SAP out of a lineup and say that's going to be the leader in ERP, and they ended up you know, doing really, really well. But the more interesting angle is if you could have figured out the customers that were implementing ERP in, in, in a really high quality fashion, those are the companies that really did well. You buy their stocks, they really took off because they were killing their other industry competitors. So, fast forward to automation. Will automation live up to its hype, in your opinion? Will it be as transformative? And will the, the practitioners of automation see the same type of uplift in their markets, in their market caps, in their competitiveness, as did sort of the early adopters and the excellent adopters of ERP, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's an interesting comparison. Um, maybe answer it slightly different way. I think the future is that automation is a non-negotiable in every enterprise organization. 
I think if you're a large organization, we have absolutely filled our, our organizations with waste. Too much overhead, too much expense, too much technical debt, and automation is an answer. This is the way we want to interact, right? We want a chat bot that actually gives us good answers, that can answer on a Tuesday at 11 p.m. at night when we want to know if the right dog food, you know, and I'm saying that, you know, that's what we want, that's the outcome we want. And businesses have to be driven by the outcome. Here's what I'm not sure about, Dave, is we have an era where over the last three to five years, a lot of products have become companies, and a lot of products became companies and ended up in public markets. And so the RPA space is one of those areas that got this explosive amount of growth. And you look at it and there's two ways. Is this horizontally a business, RPA, or is this going to be something that's going to be a target of those Microsofts and those SAPs and say, look, we need hyper-automation to be deeply integrated at the ERP, CRM, HCM, SCM level. We're going to build, buy this or we're going to build this? And you're already hearing it in the partnerships, but this is how I think the story ends. I think either the companies like UiPath get much bigger, they get much more um, rounded in their, in their offerings, or you're going to have a large company like a Microsoft come in and say, you know what, Great buy point. it rather than build can it. They right. can, they, can, can this company, maybe not so much here, but can, can a company like Automation Anywhere stay acquisition well, I use the I use the service now as, an, as, an, as, as a parallel because they're a company that I thought would always end up inside of a bigger company, and now you're like, I think they're too big. I think they've, they've oh, jumped yeah, yeah. that, that yeah, shark Yeah, yeah, they're now. acquisition proof, I would agree, but and, you know, and these so, guys aren't yet, nor is automation. They were and, for a while. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes getting bit bought is good, but what I mean is it's going to be core, and these big companies know it because they're all talking about it. But as it. independent analysts, we want to see independent companies. I want to see just, the right thing. It just makes it The right more thing fun. for customers. Yeah, but you know, okay, Oracle yeah, yeah, buying more one of more these customers. guys. More customers, yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, I guess, it's the right thing. It just makes it more fun when you have really good independent competitors that Absolutely. lead. So, Absolutely. And, and spend way more on R&D than these big companies who spend a lot more on stock buybacks. But I know you got to go. Thanks so much for spending some time, making time for theCUBE. Andy, great to see you. Good to see you as well. All right, we are wrapping up day one. Dave Vellante and Dave Nicholson live. You can hear the action behind us forward at five on theCUBE. We'll be right back.